Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today I have David Matthews of David Matthews Outfitters. And I haven't met David uh, in person. I've got him here uh, with us. And um, the first time that I heard about David was uh, through Marvin James, uh, who has uh, since passed away, but was a, uh, a very respected outfitter in New Mexico and in Arizona and Mexico. And uh, David uh, worked a lot with Marvin. And so I'm anxious to have David on today to talk about New Mexico specifically and uh, the public land hunting opportunities in New Mexico with the elk and with the deer and, and the ibex and the oryx. Uh, David, how are you doing? I'm doing good, Jay. Yeah, it's uh, great to have you on here. Like I alluded to in the intro, um, y- you had worked side by side with Marvin James. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how that friendship and, and how you began working with Marvin, how that all came to be? Yes, sir. Well, I, I started working for Marvin oh, many years ago. I, I ended up working for Marvin for going on 15 years before his passing. So I, I had a lot of time and, and was able to learn a lot of different things from Marvin, you know, some good, um, you know, some bad. And, and you know, and we had a gr- great working relationship and we, we did the best that we, the best that we could, you know. Yeah, uh, Marvin was one of those guys. I never actually met Marvin in person, uh, but most everybody knew Marvin uh, one way or another, and and um, he was definitely a character. So I'm sure there's stories that you could share with us, and I'm sure there's some that you probably couldn't because of just just the character <laughs> yeah. that he was and and great yeah. humor and such a, a, of a guy that he was. Um, yes. So did yes. you start working for him in New Mexico, or did you start in Arizona? The very first hunt I did for Marvin was in Arizona, um, and I, I came in mid-year um, and, di- and did a hunt for him, and it was kind of a trial basis. Marvin always had a trial basis with his guides, and I came in the first hunt I did, and, and we killed a fairly decent elk um, on, the, on day two of, of the hunt, and then after that, he, he begged me to go to New Mexico. I was really unsure about New Mexico, you know, being born and raised in Arizona, I, I just thought to myself, how could it get any better than Arizona? Um, well, I'm, I'm really glad that, that Marvin finally talked me into it. New Mexico is, is awesome. You know, the elk hunting is awesome. The deer hunting is awesome. It's, it's not as well known as Arizona or Utah, but I think we're getting it there. I think, I think there's a few good outfitters out there right now that are, that are really, that are really hammering good critters, and, and I think a lot of guys are, are getting a taste of what New Mexico actually has to offer. For sure. I, I want to talk with you specifically starting out about uh, the elk, and from what I understand, uh, you do all of your hunts on public ground, uh, and you d- deal primarily in units 15, 16A, and 16D. Is that correct? That's correct. I, I deal, you know, I do all of my hunts on public land um, in in those prime Gila units, unit 15, 16D, 16A. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and I've had several podcasts with some New Mexico outfitters and everybody has their own kind of little bit of a niche and, and what have you. Uh, and from what I understand uh, from putting in there and from talking to some of these uh, New Mexico outfitters, that 84% of the tags go to residents, and then 16% go to non-residents, 10 of which of the 16%, 10 of which go in the guided pool, and 6% go to the non-resident that are not putting in in the outfitted or, you know, outfitter guide pool. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, I would say that the the guided pool, um, it it increases your odds of drawing on about 95% of the hunts that New Mexico has to offer. So that's the good thing. You know, they're really... 
New Mexico is a really work friendly state, and they and they really cater to their outfitters. And and with by that, they have the guide draw, and it, it really gives the guides opportunity to acquire the work that that we need. You know, for sure. And w- w- with that, without going over all the details of how to put in, and I, I did a a podcast uh, with uh, Tom McReynolds and I've done yeah. one with Jeff Lester with Hunt Hard Outfitters. Okay. I want to I want to kind of dive in specifically with you and talk more about the units and and just some of the characteristics and qualities of each one of the units. And the first unit you mentioned there is unit 15 and I I just want you to give us kind of a geographic region, kind of the borders and you know just the overall what you're seeing you know what have you seen going on with this unit you know is it trending up is it trending down you know just just give me the overall feel for unit 15 as far as elk goes david i want to start out by asking you about unit 15 and and the the pros and cons of unit 15 and what you're seeing as far as a trend uh, I know the unit had a little bit of uh, trouble there for a while. Are you seeing it trend up, trend down? You know, and then talk about the topography, talk about the terrain, talk about the numbers of elk, and give us a general overview of Unit 15. Okay. Um, unit 15, um, in my opinion, I think it's starting to trend back up. Like you said, it, it, had, it had gone downhill a little bit, but I think it's definitely on its way back up, I think. You know, within the last two years, I've started to see the, the quality of elk seem to return, um, you know, and, and, you know, time will only tell if it's going to continue, continue going up. Um, the topography of the unit is, is 80% of the country is, is relatively flat, easy, easy walking, easy to move through. You know, if it's got a lot of mesas, you might have to hike up and get on one of the flat mesas to chase elk or, or what have it, you know, it, it's really, really, it's really con- conducive to, to somebody that, you know, maybe, maybe a little movement in, you know, enabled or, or, you know, and, and may not be able to move as well. Um, there is 20% of the unit that, that has some big canyons, um, some big draws, some big mountains. Um, those, those units are that, that part portion of the unit is, is is also good for some of the later seasons and, and the muzzleloader hunts and and what have it you know come off the, the the bulls come off the cows after the rut and and they tend to stage up in that in that country and and try and, and try and fatten back up off the off of the rut in the the the, the elk seasons there the archery seasons the september 1st through the 14th in 2017 and then the 15th through the 24th what kind of bugling can uh, guys expect that draw that first through the 14th? And then how does that uh, change, you know, moving into the 15th to the 24th? Okay. Um, September 1st through the 14th, um, it, it's, you know, a lot of people think it's, it's the lesser of the lesser of the two tags to have. Um, in my opinion, this is, I think it's a great tag to have, and this is the reason why. Sometime during the 1st to the 14th, and it's generally around September 9th, the elk really start to get going and, and rolling really well um, with the rut and bugling a lot. Um, you know, in, in those, it, sometime in that time when, when the elk start to fire up, uh, those, those bigger bulls, will, will, they'll start to go on walkabouts and, and trying to find that hot cow. Um, you will, you know, you can talk to those bigger bulls and actually have them respond and possibly call those big bulls in that time of that time of the year, you know, later in the year, we'll say on the second hunt, most of those big bulls have acquired their harems and are impossible, you know, next to impossible to call away from their harems. And it's a lot of cat and mouse hunting, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, get in front of them while they're moving or, or whatever you may have it, you know, but you will hear on that second season, you will hear a tremendous amount more bugling than you will the first season. Um, but like I said, that first season to go back to it, you actually have the, the chance um, during that first season to actually call those big bulls into to you, um, you know, looking and searching for those hot cows. Okay, and in that 15 hunt, uh, 
it, how is hunting pressure on those two seasons? I mean, compared to maybe uh, some Arizona hunts, is there any unit that, well, first question would be, is there any unit that you would compare, um, you know, unit 15 to in Arizona? Like, would is it like a unit seven or, you know, what, I, what, what ki- kind of hunting is it like? You know, I think it is like seven. Um, a lot of the country is like seven. Um, I think the hunting pressure is, is close to seven. Uh, they give out a good number of tags, but it, the unit is giant. I mean, it goes, it, it, butts up against the Arizona border um, right across from that unit 1 and 27 area that, you know, is pretty sought after in Arizona. Um, you know, that borders, unit 15 borders those units, um, and then it goes it goes about 110 miles um, east to Daddle. And then, you know, at, at some of the widest points, it's, it's about 45 miles wide. So it, it's a giant unit. Um, they do give a good number of tags out, but there's never, you know, there's really never a spot that you can't get away from somebody. You know, there's always spots that you can go where there's, there's going to be nobody there, which makes it good. You know, so those spots are are secrets and, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people, uh, really, really hammer some certain areas and, and you just have to find those certain areas outside of that. And the hunting is awesome, you know? I've heard that New Mexico elk don't bugle anything like Arizona elk. What would your response be to that? You know, in my opinion, in my opinion, even Arizona, you know, short of the, the old days, I say the old days, 20 years ago, um, you know, 20 years ago in Arizona, you used to be able to call in, you know, multiple bulls every single time you were out, you know, and, and Air, in New Mexico, when I first started hunting over there, it was, it was kind of the same way, you know, but now, now, you know, there's a lot more guys in the woods and, and you might be guys just out there with video cameras trying to video elk and, and trying to call them in. So it's created these, you know, these elk have, have, have become call shy, you know, and, and there's still some spots in Arizona that are really, really good. You can call a bunch of bulls in, but New Mexico, it, it tends to, I, I still see it in New Mexico. They don't, they don't, they don't come into the calls the way they do in Arizona. Um, they bugle just as hard, but I think, I think just because of the, the fact still, in my opinion, there's those two hunts, it's two different types of calling, you know, people calling to them, um, you know, twice a year, you know, on two different hunts, I should say, there's probably more than two different types of calling going on, but they're seeing so many, uh, so many ways that people call, um, you know, or tactics or, or, they're getting harassed and hit at every angle and called at every angle that they become a little bit jumpy. Do you think that a really good caller could still do very well? It's just the guys that maybe make sounds that, you know, aren't, aren't quite right and their timing isn't quite right. Those elk sure get keen. To 100%. 100%. You hit the nail on the head. I think a really good caller still has really good success, you know, success rate in New Mexico and calling elk in. Um, I do think that those elk are sensitive to, to you know, sounds, like you said, that, that may be a little off or timing may be a little off. And I think that they no- notice those and recognize those immediately. So, um, you know, just, just, for, just for the fact that they do see so many hunters that are, that are calling because they do have ar- two archery seasons there. In the archery hunt in 15, uh, describe kind of a typical day. And, you know, kind of expectation, you know, you're seeing handfuls of bulls, you know, numbers, how many you're seeing and like, you know, kind of average the size. And then what is like your expectation that you would tell a hunter, hey, if we can kill a bull, you know, X, Y, Z bull, you've done really, really well. Okay. Yeah. I think well, just an average day in unit 15, um, you know, on any given spot. If you can hear elk bugling, you can you can get in there, and I, I think you know just an average day you could probably lay eyes on on maybe a half a dozen or more different bulls, um, just for the simple fact that it's pretty flat, you know. I mean, you actually have to sneak up on them and, and be within that that certain range of actually seeing them, you know, in the thick junipers. So I think you could see a hand different a handful of different bulls, and and I think that 
you know, I think I think I tell guys all the time when, when they're wanting to know about unit 15 and what's, you know, reality and what's expectation, I tell guys all the time, if, if, if you come out with the expectation of, of, you know, a 330 or 340 type of bull, I think you're going to have a great time. You know, and, and why I say 330 or 340 is it tends to be, um, you know, that 330 type of elk are the bulls, you know, a lot of the bulls that are herd bulls over there are in that are in that range. You know, now don't get me wrong, there's 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 bigger bulls in the unit and, and a lot bigger bulls in the unit, but I tend to tell guys, you know, that three thirty bull is, is a lot of what you're gonna see because that's that's what's that's what's running these harems, you know, that's those are the herd bulls in, in that in that um in that unit in that area. So uh and then as you transition into um muzzle loader I, I don't believe they have any rifle hunts in there. I believe it's archery and muzzleloader. You can correct me. Um, what are the expectations for that muzzleloader hunt? I think the expectation is is about the same. Um, you know, as far as as far as size, there is, like you said, there is no rifle hunt, so it is a muzzleloader. It's a primitive weapon unit only. Um, so I think it's the expectation is about the same size, but the hunting. The hunting tactic or the way you approach it will change um, dramatically. I think you're going to need to. The, the muzzleloader season is almost almost about a week too late for the rut, you know. So you're you're it changes from chasing bulls in the thick trees that are bugling to you know perching up on a high point and glassing. So you're going to have to you know you're going to be looking in canyons and and draws and and that type of stuff. I thought you know getting up on high hills that then maybe surrounding some of the flat country and kind of glassing down into that country and, and trying to pick one up and, and you know, and, and trying to, you know, put a hunter on a type of hunt. It's more of a spot spot and stock style uh, rather than, you know, actually chasing bulls and, and calling bulls in like the archery hunt. Is there a youth hunt in 15 as well? Yes, there is. And the youth hunt is actually the hunt to have. It's generally the first week of October. And um, I would say nine years out of ten, the bulls are still bugling fairly well. Um, you know, still there's still probably ninety percent of the big bulls are still with cows. You know, some of some of the big bulls are starting to pull off. I know this last year um, during the youth hunt, we had we had two bulls in an area that that we were hunting. Um, one bull ended up being just shy of three eighty, and there was another one in there that that we all thought would exceed four hundred. Well, we had some we had some other guys in there that were looking at the same elk, and we kind of told told each other and and talked to the hunter about it, and we decided that either one of the bulls opening morning, um, we would we would uh, we would shoot you know the first second we had a chance. So we go in there opening morning, and sure enough, there's vehicles you know all over the place. You know, it was from it, it's from a it's from a fairly popular spot that we were able to spot the elk from so a lot of guys you know as they're driving through the unit say yeah that's a pretty good spot i'm gonna pull up there and look so a lot of people knew about the elk and we got in there opening morning and about about nine minutes after legal shooting light we actually had the smaller the two bulls walk out at 86 yards and 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 we shot them and and we were happy to do so you know after 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 the smoke cleared um you know the elk kind of scattered and i know the bigger bull um wasn't killed and he actually ran off to be hunted again this year so and that was on that youth hunt and there was a lot of lot of action a lot of a lot of bugling um going on that time so is that one of the better bulls that you've personally guided on over there in 15 you know in in 15 it, it's one of the better ones the, that time of year, you know, during during the October hunt, you know, during the October season, because we have killed a couple governor tag bulls um, in you know fifteen that exceed four hundred. But um, you know, in that time of the year, October, when they're starting to wind down and they're starting to pull off, yeah, that that is one of the better bulls that, that I've actually had the opportunity to kill that time of year. So. Every year in Unit Fifteen on on the archery hunt you know is is there a bull you know 370 plus every single year that gets shot or is it more like you know every single year there's a 350 like what what would be year in and year out like the top end bull i think 
coming off there that actually gets harvested? I think every year um, the top end's probably in that 370 range or, or better. I know last year, I mean, we were we were two inches away from uh, killing a bull with an archery hunter that was 390. You know, he just shot it above the lungs and below the spine at 42 yards. I mean, like I said, just a couple inches lower, and we just killed a you know a giant. But I think for the most part, I think there's every year there's there's a there's a a, bu- a bull or two that that exceed 370 that ki- killed there. Um, I think you know more of the more of the 350 is more of the trophy range that that are actually harvested um, in that unit 15 you know per year per calendar year. And the bull that the youth uh, the kid got last year with you, what was it? It actually scored that you said it scored 376. So, um, yeah, that's a heck of a, yeah, he was really good. Great bottom end, great top end, wide, you know, just short beams. You see a lot of short beams in New Mexico. Um, it's, it's rare to see, see a bull that's got 55 inch plus beams, you know, I mean, that's a long, that's long beams for anywhere, but I mean, it's really rare to see, you know, something that's, that's 55 ever, even on some of the bulls that we've killed that were, that were 400 plus. Um, you know, I, I can't think of one off the top of my head that had a 55 inch beam. So it, it was all length and mass and, and, and put together in different ways. Are there any other characteristics that, you know, 15 is known for, or that New Mexico is known for, you know, short thirds, big tops, yeah. I mean, wide, you know, heavy, a lot of, a lot of the upper class bulls that, that we've been killing, honestly, have great thirds. Um, a characteristic that I see a lot in that Gila is triple brows. A lot of triple brows on some of the upper upper class elk. You know, some of the bigger bulls seems like at least fifty percent of them when, when they're getting in that three seventy and up. You know, range it seems like they're starting to sprout that that triple brow time. You know, and I think it's just a uh, uh, genetic, you know, dominant genetic, you know, gene that's over there in those Gila units. Okay, let's um, jump uh, into 16A okay. uh, and and do the same. Give me the rundown on 16A. Okay, okay. 16A is is it's a little the topography is different. 16A is more canyons. Um, there's not as much flat ground. You know, some of the some of the primary elk country is a lot of you know deep canyons, steep steep mountains. A lot of you know it, it's a lot more physically demanding than, than unit 15 for sure. Um, I think the elk, you know, there's, there give out less permits in those units. So, um, I think the elk numbers are, are close to, you know, the same per square mile as 15. Uh, it just seems that there's a lot less people in the woods and, and a lot more guys kind of try and focus on, on the easier country to hunt. So if, if, if you're able to, and you and you can get around, well, you can get away from people and, and, and have the elk all to yourself in, in a little bit tougher country to get to and get them out, but it, it makes the hunting so much better. So in your mind, 16A is definitely a step above the quality in 15? Yes, yes, I, I, I agree 100%, and in my mind, 16A is a step above 15 like I said, and, and, and it may just be uh, for the simple fact that it's it's harder to, you know, harder access, you know, guys can't get around as well, and, and you know, and there's not a there's not a road at the bottom of every canyon and, and not a road to the top of every hill, like in, you know, 15. So I think, I think that has a lot to do with it. So those elk are able to actually get that extra year, you know, and, and grow that extra set of antlers and and, and, you know, and gain the age that they need to actually fully mature and, and you know, and, and be as big as they can. What would you say an average day in 16A on the archery hunt uh, as far as seeing and hearing bulls and then uh, branch into the size of bulls and kind of expectations as on that? Unit? Okay, I think 16A, you know, a day of hunting in 16A on the archery hunt, um, I think you do see quite a few more elk just for the simple fact that it's not flat and thick. I mean, you can see across canyons. I mean, you can actually lay eyes on a bull 
um, you know, before it's within shooting range. So you kind of know, you know, you can hear a bull bugling over there. You can throw up the glass and check him out and make sure he's either the bull you want or the bull you don't. Um, I think you probably see twice as many elk uh, as you do in, in 15 per day just for that fact that you can see, a, you know, the distance. You can, you can look across those canyons. A lot of the, a lot of the unit is burned now. Um, they've had some fire, you know, some fires that have come through and, and, and burned up a bunch of the trees. So you can actually, you know, it, it makes for, makes for seeing them, you know, a lot better also. And I think, you know, I think I tell guys all the time when they have that 16A tag, you know, the sky's the, really the limit in that country. Um, but I, w- I would, you know, I, I'd tell them that 340 type of bull is more or less the kind of bulls that are running around and, and you know, the ones that actually, that are actually the herd bulls in the area. So um, do we see bulls bigger oh, all the time? And, and almost every day you'll see a bull um, bigger than 340. But it, it is, you know, I just tell guys so they, they don't, they don't, you know, just in case the hunting might be a little tough that, that they don't, that they don't get down on the hunt and they can keep on cranking away with, with that type of bull in mind. Now with 16 D out of 15, 16 A and 16 D is 16 D better in your mind than 16 A or is 16 A better? And I'm talking about the archery hunt. I think 16 D in my opinion is um, better for one reason only. I think, you know, genetically, I think they're all grown, you know, the same. I think for one reason only it's better, and that's because the number of hunters that are actually hunting the unit, um, you know, the number of tags that New Mexico gives out is less. You know, it's almost cut in half. And the unit size is, is it may be a, a plus smaller than 16 a, but it's not by much, you know. And, and so you're only dealing with half the hunters, um, you know, on all of the seasons, actually, the archery, the rifle, all the seasons, they only give out about half the number of tags. So I think with that being said, I think, you know, a lot of the elk are, are getting to that, getting to that prime age and a lot, and they're growing a lot, lot bigger bulls in that unit just for the simple fact that there's only half the hunters there. Um, so only half the elk are getting harvested over 16A, you know, type of hunt. So I'm looking at the Go Hunt uh, insider they're a title sponsor here of the podcast and i'm looking at the new mexico draw odds i'm looking at the non-resident pool for uh 16d and i'm looking at the 15th to the 24th uh there's there's only four total tags in that six percent non-resident you know not talking about the yeah. outfitter draw yep. just the regular non-resident it's a 0.57 percent yeah there's 924 people that applied for it and you have under a one percent, it's a five. It's a point five seven percent chance to draw. Yeah, it's a half a percent. But I, I compare that with the yeah. I compare that with sixteen uh, D and the guided or outfitter pool. A one point nine percent chance for six tags. There were um, it looks like uh, four hundred and sixty nine people that put in for that. Yeah. So one point nine does not sound like a lot, but it's well over twice as is as good of draw odds to put in in the guided pool as versus the the non-resident you know regular yes pool. yes without a doubt you know and then there's there's always the only other way around it is you know if if you want to look into a landowner tag purchase they do have some landowner tags in the unit also but uh they are they are a little spendy you know so um but you know it it is it it doubles your odds you know, it's not good. Like I tell everybody, it's still not a good odd, but it doubles your odds if you actually apply with the outfitter there. Yeah. And speaking about 16 D, is it feasible to think if you have a 16 D archery tag that, you know, you, you have a chance to kill a bull over 350. And is that kind of a benchmark where you say, you know, shoot any bull over 350 or is that like the low end bench yeah i tell guys you know i tell guys i always tell them you know shoot what you're going to be happy with but in my opinion try not to shoot anything under 350 because if if you do then personally on on just an average year in the unit i think um 350 is is kind of a is kind of a benchmark 
but it might be on the lower end. Um, there are a lot of bulls in that 360 type range that you will see, you know, hunting and, and spending some time there. Um, and, and, you know, there's bulls all the way up. I mean, we've killed several bulls in the unit over 400. So, like I said, that 350 range, you know, I tell guys all the time that 350 is kind of the lower benchmark, but, you know, the sky really is truly the limit there. And with the amount of hunters, it, it, I mean, you just feel like you're, you're, you're the only one in the unit. There's, there's spots in the unit that, that I've hunted for 10, 15 years, and, and I can remember maybe once in 10 years where I've actually run into or heard another hunter. You know, um, it's just it. It's just so much, so much better. You know, hunting pressure is just is so much better in that unit. And and with that being said, I think that's why the bulls do do respond a little better to calls there. Um, and and you actually have a chance at at uh, maybe making a little screw up and still having them respond and come in. So you're gonna say 16D is better because of the it's fewer hunters. Yes. But 16A and 16D have very similar bulls, yep. but you're going to give the nod to 16D as the best unit, in your opinion, that you guide or best unit in the state because of the lack of hunters. Um, so the hunting pressure and, it, you know, just a little more interaction with the elk, it's, it's in your mind, more of a premium tag than 16 Yes, that, in my opinion, that is it 100%. So... Um, I think you're right on the money there, and that and that's my opinion. Um, others may may differ with it, but in my opinion, that's that is the number one tag in New Mexico to have. How are those um, muzzleloader and rifle hunts in 16A? Do they go in the thick and nasty, and does it get pretty dang tough? Well, you know, it really doesn't. Um, it. it they don't really go into the thick nasty um, in that unit. They they tend to stay out on, uh, you know, the kind of focus in the, those new freshly burnt areas. So it's a it's a lot of glassing and it could be some long shooting, um, but primarily you're still able to still able to lay eyes on on quite a few different elk every day, um, you know, you know. Uh, depending on how mobile you may be and, and all of that. A lot of walking, you know, uh, ridge top walking and, and, and glassing and that type of thing. So, If you had to have your choice of a rifle tag, would you pick A or B? Last year I would have chose 16A. Um, last year we had the quality of bulls in 16A were a little bit better than they were in 16D. Um, I, I would say on average, though, I would, I would take a 16D tag over 16A um, just for the simple fact that it seems like I'm always able to find a better bull in 16D than, than in 16A um, just because I think a few more elk make it through the hunts in, in 16D over 16A um, and, and are able to get to that, get to that monster status. On those muzzleloader, correct me if I'm wrong, but it like goes muzzleloader season and then it goes right into the rifle seasons. Um, what what kind of quality, like, you know, let's say a guy can get around fairly well. Let's say the guy's, you know, shot a handful of elk. Um, you know, I mean, is 350 plus pushing it? You know, are we, are we dealing with breakage? What's the story on quality expectations on the muzzleloader and on the rifle okay well in in or is there is there no muzzle yeah loader? there's Sorry no to interrupt is there no muzzleloader no there's not no it goes straight from it goes straight okay. in from archery to the rifle hunts in those two units okay what is the quality expectation as far as rifle hunting i think i think that better than the archery or I, I think it's relatively i think it's I think it might be a little better with how patient you are um, and, and how much time that you, you spend. You know, I think scouting is a must, you know, and how much time that you spend scouting um, and how much time you put into it, you'll definitely see that in return on, on the actual hunt. Um, I think that uh, I think the, the one big thing is, is you'll see the same quality elk um, on that rifle hunt, maybe a fuzz better, but you don't have to be within that magical 50 yard mark. You know, you can be out there with, with some of the technology anymore today. Guys are shooting 600 plus yards. 
So, I mean, with that being said, I think your odds of actually killing a 350 bull or better um, on those rifle hunts has, it, it increases, you know, every year just for the simple fact that guys are, that long range game is really, is really coming into play anymore. And a lot of guys, more and more guys every year I see with, with these long range, you know, uh, rifles that, that are made by these, by these big, by these big rifle companies. Let's talk a little bit about long range while we're okay. at it. Um, what kind of long range glassing, like what are you using for binoculars? Are you a fan of the, you know, the Koas or the doctors or the twin, the, the twin spotting skills? What do you, like? you know what this, this new, this new Swarovski that's coming out, it looks like the ticket, but I'll be honest with you. I, I've done the, I've done the Koas. I just, in, in my opinion, the angled eyepiece, um, it's just not not quite for me. Um, so that's why that's why that's why I would you know that's why I don't really go with the Koas. Um, I I personally have uh, the Swarovski 95 millimeter straight, and that's that's what I use for my long range my long range looking. So are you using 15s and then and then using the 95 once you need to zoom in on yes. something? I have that 95 as well, and it's it's an unbelievable spotting scope, best I've ever looked. Yeah, at. I'm, yeah, that's what I use, and that, and I'm excited, you know, with this new with the new uh, Swarovski uh, adapter that you're actually going to be able to slap on that 95. I can't wait to actually get my hands on it and and do some looking for it. Um, I think I think it's gonna yeah, I think it's gonna change too. it up and and and. And open some doors <laughs> for a guy like me. So yeah, you know, I I am I'm, I'm one of those guys that uh, I just switched from the Koas. Darn, and I both sold our Koas, and um, uh, I switched to the 65 millimeter twin spotting scopes, and I really like that setup. And I like one of the things I've t- talked about on this podcast. I like the fact from a weight standpoint, it's just you know seven and a half pounds to using the same little tripod that I use and um you know from a weight savings you know where you've got 30 pounds or something with the koas and the big tripod and the stool yeah um you know and i was i was optimistic this week when i saw the btx come out from Swarovski, and i haven't seen it yet in person i've seen you know like everybody else has i've seen the photos and a few videos online um and i think the concept is fantastic yeah um, but I, I'm not going to crown it the king until I have a chance to look through yep. it. I think it could be phenomenal. If it's half as good as I think it's going to be, it's probably going to be unreal. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that like, until you actually look through it, like I, it just b- boggles my mind how there's so many people out there saying it's the best thing since sliced bread and they haven't even looked. Yeah. Through. Yep. Like, I am not even gonna. <laughs> I'm not even gonna weigh in on it until I get to you. Yeah, yeah, I feel like you. It's, I feel it's you. just not, you know. But have you seen that too? Have you seen a bunch of guys out there hyping it, and it's like, yeah, you know, if it turns out to be not as good as you think, you've just lost your credibility because you've hyped something that who who hyped something they haven't tried. Yeah, no, I, I I feel you. I think it's just. Uh, you know, Swarovski has the household name already, and and you know that when you're buying their product, it seems to be, you know, top of the line. I, I just don't think, uh, personally, I think, and I'm talking in their in their aspect or their standpoint. I think that they could just think because Swarovski's put their name on it that it's going to be it's going to be everything that everybody's hoping for. You know what I'm saying? But I, I have a hard time saying uh, it's going to be, you know, it, I think it's going to be awesome, but do I know? I have no idea just yet, but I'm I'm hoping that it's going to be as awesome as awesome as, as everybody says. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I'm in the same boat. I mean, I, I am a Swarovski user. I, I, I have every piece of optic that I have is Swarovski. Uh, since I sold the Koas, now I don't own any other optics. Um, every piece of glassing, spotting scope, rifle scope is Swarovski. Um, and, but still, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic by nature. Yeah. 
and I want to try it out, but I think it could be phenomenal. I think, you know, the idea of being able to have both eyes going with that 95 millimeter with the, you know, the big light gathering capability of that 95 millimeter objective, uh, and then throw in the fact of, you know, the 1.4, uh, I think it's a 1.4 extender, yeah. um, you know, that's going to be a fixed extender that, you know, like you're going to have to unscrew it to take the extender yeah. off. But there's times, you know, we've all been up on big, big knobs and stuff with the sun, right? Where, you know, if it's right, you can look a long, long ways. And so I'm excited about it just like you yep. are. I was just curious what you're using. I, I want to transition a little bit here uh, into uh, deer in New Mexico. Okay. And, you know, for me, deer in New Mexico is a little bit kind of hit or miss because, um, you know, Arizona obviously has the standby, you know, phenomenal units, you know, 13B and 13A and, you know, the Kayabab and, you know, those units, you know, very, very well. Yeah. Um, but, but it seems like New Mexico doesn't, you know, they've got the Hickory, uh, Indian reservation that's known for giant deer. Um, and then, you know, you're probably going to talk about the units that kind of surround the Hickory, yeah. yep. but it, overall in general, it seems like it's a real hit or miss thing with New Mexico, you know, big buck here, big buck there, but nothing really consistent. Um, tell me about the deer in New Mexico and the areas, uh, that you focus on. Okay. Yeah, I do. Like you said, I do primarily focus on, on those units that surround the Hickory, um, I think the genetics up in that area are, are second to none. A matter of fact, if, if you actually sit down and look in the record books, um, you will see just as many entries from Rio, Rebra County, and New Mexico um, as, as anywhere else. You know, they, they've got the genetics there. Um, and, and primarily, I tend to, to just hunt those units around the Hickory, um, you know, 2A, 2B, 2C, uh, 5B, 7. Um, you know, the Rio Chama over there, um, I- any one of those units over there are, are, are just as likely to turn up a giant um, a- as anywhere, you know, anywhere in New Mexico. But I, I are probably quite a bit better chance of, of turning up a giant in those units than, than anywhere else in New Mexico. What, um, how are the timing of the seasons there and kind of walk through which hunts you like? Okay. Uh, generally, I mean, they, they do have the early uh, deer hunts that start, you know, in, in October and, uh, you know, maybe even a couple in September up there in that area. But primarily the, the more trophy hunts um, for the deer or the, the more likely to be a trophy hunt are the hunts that, that are kind of approaching the rut. You know, those hunts that are the second week in November, you know, there's a couple of those units that offer some hunts in the second second week of November. Um, and, and those hunts are, are, in my opinion, they're the hunt to have. You know, you start to get some of that pre-rut action. You, you'll catch a lot of bucks that are cruising. You know, you won't get to see many bucks, you know, as an adult in New Mexico. They just don't offer any any really, truly rut hunt for the deer as an adult in New Mexico. They do have some super super youth hunts there that are the first week of December, which is, in my opinion, is the peak of the rut in New Mexico. So, uh, but as far as in the adult, you know, they don't, as close as you're going to get to the rut is the second week in November, and it's going to be a lot of pre-rut action, um, you know, catching bucks cruising, you know, starting to, starting to act like they want to do something about the rut. Those youth hunts, do you guide those youth hunts? If people were to contact you, would that be right in your wheelhouse? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I, I love those youth hunts, you know, for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, getting the youth into hunting is is, is really important. You know, um, having, having some boys of my own, um, you know, I just, I just see the opportunity um, in these youth hunts to have them experience the best. You know, it's the best. You know, it, there'll be hunts that they'll never forget, you know, because the rut is going and, and they'll see bucks that are chasing those and, and that type of thing. I mean, it's action packed and, and for the youth, I think that's awesome. For sure. What kind of quality deer like ha- have you been seen or have you guys harvested in, in some of these, you know, 2A, 2B, 2C, 5B, 7, some of these units? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, um, Year to year, our, our main focus and everybody's kind of main focus, everybody's wanting to kill a 200-inch deer, you know. Um, I think 
there's the possibility in these units to do that. You know, I really do with, with a lot of hard work and a, and a lot of patience. You know, I know the hunting seasons in New Mexico uh, on their rifle seasons aren't, aren't the longest. You know, that's one complaint I have with New Mexico. Is they want to, you know, they want to be known as a, a trophy uh, state, but on their trophy hunts, they only give you five days to actually do it. And so, uh, with that being said, a lot of hard work, a lot of hard, you know, scouting and, and putting your time in. I think that 200 inch uh, mark, I think is is doable. Um, you know, I don't I don't think they're around every tree, but you know, from 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 year to year, we tend to kill a couple in New Mexico that are over 200. You know, I, we've killed a buck a couple years ago with a governor's tag in New Mexico that was 240. So um, those those type of bucks live there. Um, they're they're not many. You know, it's not like the Arizona Strip where where the likelihood of, of coming across one is, is you know, fairly decent. Um, you still got to put in your time and, and effort, and, and you may may be rewarded and, and get lucky. I'm, I'm sure it's hard for you being an outfitter for deer in Arizona and being an outfitter for deer in New Mexico because it's all kind of going off at the same time. How do you balance that as an outfit? You know, it's, I'm lucky um, just for the simple fact, we'll just, we'll start in, you know, the unit two C, the latest rifle hunt there. Uh, the latest rifle hunt is the week before the late Kaibab. So, and, and well, and I used to do some, you know, I, I've done work on 13B, um, but now the 13B has gone, uh, you know, the week later, it used to be the week before it was perfect because you could go to 13B, you know, and you could hunt it out and you can, on a, a lot of my hunts, I have one guy, you know, um, a, another, another spotter per se, quote unquote, with me helping, helping me out. I'll, I'll send a, a guy early to New Mexico while I'm finishing up in 13B and that way I can come in there and, and have his knowledge plus a couple days um, in 2C to find something for a hunter. And then you do that hunt and then you get to go over straight back to Arizona for the Kaibab hunt and spend a couple days scouting before that hunt starts. So they're all, they're all offset from each other. You know, there's not very really many of the hunts that actually overlap. Um, so that would be super tough, you know, uh, trying to do deer hunts in both states at the same time. So we're lucky that, that New Mexico actually has them offset from, from the deer hunts in Arizona. Like the, I'm looking at the, um, go hunt insider here and it looks like the two C hunt is November 11th through November 15th. So what you're saying is that's a short season, but the dates are really good. Like, uh, there's, there's, uh, only two tags i'm looking at the guided draw there's only two tags 636 applicants it's 0.43 percent yeah it's tough but the quality of hunt uh like i mean is it is it feasible to to think i'm gonna draw that tag and kill a 200 incher Uh, or is it like feasible to say you know 180 plus is is pretty definitely definitely 180 plus i mean like i said it's it's probably it's probably the best the best unit in New Mexico, and it it will. I mean, New Mexico is more known. They don't have a lot of the big, giant, non-typical genetics. They have more of the big, typical frame deer, you know. So the, you'll see a lot, lot, lot more typical, you know, bigger typicals than you will, you know, ever see any non non-typical genes. So I think that 180, 180 benchmark is is really feasible. I mean, is is really feasible. Um, you know, on that hunt, on that, on that later hunt, I really, I think that that, that is really feasible. With your elk and with your deer, do you run a lot of trail cameras in New Mexico? I do. I run, a, I run quite a few, um, you know, being, being involved in some of, some of the, uh, statewide stuff. Uh, I probably run more than others, you know, run more trail cameras and, than others. And, and we kind of widespread them, you know, for the deer we'll set, you know, a good number two A, two B, two C, five B. You know, we'll run a lot of cameras there. Uh, the biggest thing about New Mexico, and I don't know what 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 is their deal, but New Mexico seems like um, you put your camera out, you 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 just have a great feeling, or, or you better know that when you come back to it, it's there's a fifty fifty chance that it's going to be gone. Unlike Arizona, you know, I run a lot of cameras on on the Arizona Strip also. And, and you have sure you have a couple stolen every year, but it seems like 
it seems like New Mexico has a huge problem with, with thieves finding your camera and stealing them um, rather than just leaving them and walking by. That's a bummer. Yeah, it, it really is a bummer. I mean, I would pro- Do you think it's hunters or do you think it's non-hunters? You know, I, up there, I don't know because because obviously we've never caught them. But up there, I don't know. I think uh, it could be a lot of the oil. There's a lot of oil guys up there. So it could it could either be uh, guys from the oil field. Or, or, you know, it may happen to be some of the early hunters, but it's a hard to tell because there are so many different, uh, different types of people that are going to be out there. You know, guys that could be working in the oil field. There's, there's thousands of guys that work in the oil field and, and drive out through that country daily. So I, I, it's hard to say. It really is. What's your favorite trail cam as far as performance? Right now, um, I'm running a lot of stealth. Um, I've run the coverts. But right now I'm running a lot of stealth. Um, I really, really love the G30, um, and it's it's older stealth. Uh, it's I mean it was new a couple of years ago, and I really love the quality um, the quality of pictures and video that you can get from that camera um, is is awesome. You know, uh, great great battery life, um, and, and that's that's what I run right now. David, you also do um, ibex and oryx hunts tell us about those hunts okay well the oryx hunt um if you draw it um on base they do have some off-range stuff but if you draw it on base it's it's a once in a lifetime draw it's not a once in a lifetime kill um it's a once in a lifetime draw so if you do draw it you know you have three days and there's no guarantee that that you actually get to hunt all three days you have to check in with the military um daily um, you have to go to the orientation, and there could be one day where you get there to go hunt, and they've got the whole base closed down because they're going to have some, you know, some some practice runs with with you know the with the the jets and and the aircraft, you know, the military aircraft. So, um, but. Um, on the other on the other hand, when you do get to hunt them, uh, they're they're super fun. They they've got eyes like an antelope. You know, they they can see forever. Um, they're they're pretty tough, and they and they actually you know they're actually a pretty smart animal to hunt. So you got to be careful hunting them and 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 know what you're doing because you could blow a lot of stocks because of their eyes and 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 they actually you know to go back to it, they have some places on the military base that are no inner zones. You can't enter them, and and those are those uh, oryx. They know where those are at. So if you push them real hard, they'll just run to the the, the zones. They're called the red zones, and uh, if they enter them, you can't chase them onto them. So, and the ibex um, in New Mexico, um, they're all right down there on the Florida mountains. Um, they say that there's some in, in some of the surrounding mountains, but I've yet to see them. Um, so primarily they're all right there on the Florida mountains, just south of dimming. Um, and, and they're pretty tough, hardy animal also. I mean, they're pretty amazing to watch. I know a lot of guys that, that sheep hunt, you know, come and do the Ibex, the Ibex hunt in New Mexico and, and, you know, and they love it because it's, you know, you're, you're looking at them in sheep country and, and they're just as agile as those sheep and they really get around in that. Uh, they're pretty amazing to watch, you know, they get around in that country so well and, you know, running up or running down or running across, you know, sheer, sheer drop offs and, and, you know, but they're pretty amazing to watch, you know, they can get around really well in their country and, and can run across some unbelievable stuff and, and they're really agile animals and, and they're 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 fun to hunt. They've got great eyes. You know they can see you coming from a long ways. Um, and and the cat and mouse the cat and mouse game is is pretty is pretty fun with them. You know being in that country and trying to outsmart them or, or outsmart their eyes and be able to get get within range of of actually shooting one. Have you drawn uh, an oryx or ibex hunt yourself? Not for myself. I'm still I'm still waiting. You know, it's it's they're pretty tough draw. Like like I said, the oryx is a once in a lifetime draw. Um, the only reasonable ibex hunt there is to draw that that even has a decent chance is is the archery hunt. And um, you know, and it's it's tough. You know, like I said, it's tough to get close to them because their eyes are so good. And they know their mountain so well, and they can they can move through it you know, so well, um, they're able to just disappear 
on you when you're when you're trying to put stocks on them with a with a bow you know so you got to know a few little a few little crossings they have some crossings that they'll go run through you know um you know to get away from guys and stuff like that so primarily you try and you try and maybe intercept them from from uh some other hunters that might push them towards you you know that's one tactic other tactic is just cross your fingers and hope you can hope you can slip up on one do you like New Mexico's draw system in the fact that there are no bonus points and when you put in for elk and when you put in for deer, like it, it everybody has the same chance? Do you, uh, you know, obviously within your category, whether you're a non-resident, a resident, or a non-resident that's going in the guided pool, do do you do you like that system compared to Arizona, or do you like Arizona's draw system better? Well, this there's there's good and bad in in it. And in, in for for many reasons, I think the good reason is is it gives guys that are new to hunting or new to applying. You know what I'm saying? Younger guys that, that haven't been applying for a long time, they have the same chance. You know, some of these some of these hunts, they have the same chance of drawing as anybody else. The bad thing is is Arizona. You can almost kind of guess when you're you know within a couple of years of when you're probably going to draw that tag. In New Mexico, it's not that way, so you can't you can't really plan it. You know, a lot of guys you talk to in Arizona are like, man, I've got, I've got 18 points or I've got 20 points. And, you know, you almost know by what they're applying for, you know, they've only got a couple of years left before they draw, you know, New Mexico is the complete opposite of that. They could draw the very first year they apply. So, I mean, it, it just, it just pays to apply every year um, in hopes that you could draw. But like I said, the younger guys in Arizona, if you if you don't have max bonus points or are just new to applying, um, the chances of them ever drawing some of the best the best hunts in Arizona are are slim to none. You know, so so you know it's it's a catch twenty two. It's you know it's it's a flip of the coin. You know, like I said, the younger guys have have an opportunity at some of the best best hunts you know in new mexico they have an opportunity their their op- or their their chance is just as good as is the next guy so it, it is it is good and it is bad you see what i'm saying you can't you can't plan your annual sure. hunt um because you know that you're getting close and bonus points um in the state of new mexico it's one of those surprise units what you know whether you draw or not for sure. It's a great stuff. Uh, we covered a lot of good ground today. Um, I, I want to give you a chance to tell the listeners how they can reach you uh, and uh, remind the listeners that we've got a March 22nd uh, deadline in New Mexico. And if you're going in the guided draw, you have to be contracted with your outfitter. Uh, so, you know, they, they got to get on the stick and get that done. Uh, David, give, give the listeners how they can reach you. Okay. Well, you guys can always reach me, um, uh, via email, uh, DM outfitters at hotmail.com, or you can go to my website and contact me through my website. It's David Matthews outfitters.com. Um, or you can give me a call on my cell 928-300. 6405 and like jay said you know it's approaching quickly march 22nd um it's right around the corner um you've got to be in by then and if you guys just have any questions or or need some answers on something um feel free to call me anytime and and yeah i look forward to talking hunting with everybody so yeah it, david it's been great talking to you uh i want to take a second here and thank my sponsors gohunt.com insider Lorenzo and his crew over there do a great job. Uh, remind the listeners to use the J. Scott promo code when signing up for the Insider, and they're going to get a $50 Kuyu gift card. I also want to thank Jason Harrison uh, over at Kuyu, uh, Kuyu.com, and we're going to have some great promos coming with Kuyu, uh, as well as Phonescope.com, Cheston Davis out of Beaver, Utah, uh, use the J Scott 16 promo code and get a 10% discount on phone scope, which adapts, uh, any phone, uh, to any binocular or spotting scope. And then the outdoorsman's, uh, the optics authority, uh, the guys Cody Nelson and the crew there in Phoenix, uh, outdoorsman's.com or 1-800-291-8065. Use the J Scott promo code and you're going to get a 10% discount down there at the outdoorsman's. 
David, it's been awesome having you on. I've never met you, um, but I feel like I know you after spending time here an hour picking your brain on these units in New Mexico and um, when the Arizona deer and and, uh, sheep when that comes around, I'll have to have you on again to do some chatting. Okay. And, um, maybe we can talk again this summer. Uh, your overall outlook for moisture in New Mexico, um, what, what are you seeing over there? What, what do you think? I think it's going to be well above average. I think that, um, you know, the antler growth this year is going to be, I mean, it can rival any of the best years that we've ever had. You know, just the winter hasn't been too tough with that growth moisture, you know, with a couple, you know, a couple spring rains and, and you know, a uh, uh, monsoon season that starts on schedule. I think it's going to be awesome. I really do. That's great. Well, we're looking forward to it. It's an exciting time of year. We've got to get these apps in and then it's a little bit of a wait, but uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully some podcast listeners of mine will take this information and draw some good tags and i want to wish you the best of success and thanks for sharing and uh, god bless you buddy okay thank you jay have a good one